if you're looking at privacy in Canada, I would suggest that you make sure what the Five Eyes Agreement is. Crazy how few people know about it. I didn't even know what Five Eyes is. Post-World War II between the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. We're, we're, okay, we're down the rabbit hole. <laughs> should we put on our tinfoil hats? We should, yes. Get in your tinfoil rooms, put your little tinfoil party hats on. We're going to get into this. The Five Eyes Alliance is an intricate web of global intelligence, a covert club that continues to redefine geopolitical landscapes. Comprising five English-speaking countries, this powerful intelligence alliance has established an unprecedented era of surveillance and information sharing that continues to shape the world's approach to national security. The Five Eyes Alliance is an intelligence network established in post-World War II between the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. That is true. If you are escaping the United States, do not go to any of these other countries. <laughs> its genesis lies in the post-war 1946 UK-USA agreement intended as a cooperative arrangement for sharing signals intelligence over time this partnership has extended its reach becoming an integral part of global intelligence and security operations these nations collaboratively work on intelligence matters pulling their resources and sharing sensitive information to ensure collective security and combat global threats beyond the core five eyes there are also extended alliances known as the nine eyes and 14 eyes the nine eyes alliance includes the original five eyes countries along with countries like denmark france the netherlands and norway the 14 eyes further extends this group by also including germany belgium italy spain and sweden so it's basically the west these alliances enhance global surveillance capabilities but also spark debates about privacy and the boundaries of national security the Five Eyes Alliance might sound like a plot out of a riveting spy novel, but its implications for the public are far from fictional. In essence, this intelligence network is a double-edged sword. It represents a compelling power to uphold national security and tackle global threats, which undeniably contributes to public safety. However, this formidable power doesn't come without a price, our privacy. In the interconnected digital world we inhabit, the line between surveillance for safety and invasion of privacy has blurred. Edward Snowden's 2013 revelations peeled back the curtain on the extensive data harvesting activities of the Alliance, throwing a spotlight on the precarious balance between security and individual privacy rights. In this landscape, our digital footprints, including emails, phone calls, online shopping, and social media activity, could be open books, potentially read without our knowledge or consent. This stark reality fuels ongoing debates about privacy, state power, and the fine line between surveillance and civil liberties. This is where a common heard phrase enters the debate. If you're doing nothing wrong, you've got nothing to hide. Anyone that I know that isn't that concerned about privacy, that's what they say. That's always the response is like, okay, well, I have nothing to hide. So why would I be concerned? This argument is often used to justify surveillance practices, suggesting that those leading law abiding lives shouldn't be concerned about privacy invasions. Again, not accounting for the bias in big data, but whatever. However, this standpoint is simplistic and overlooks a key facet of privacy. It isn't solely about hiding wrongdoing. Privacy is also about the right to control personal information, the freedom to express opinions without fear of reprisal, and maintaining spaces where we can be free from outside observation. When you're with a group, you get to choose what you say and what you don't say. And that gets to kind of control, uh, to an extent, their perception of you. But it also gets to control like how vulnerable you feel and how in control of the situation you feel. There will be some situations where you are filtered and it's not necessarily because you have bad thoughts that you're not willing to share, but just you don't want to share that with these people because you don't, you don't feel comfortable with that. You want them to, you, you want this to be your own. I, like that is a right, that is privacy to me. You might with your family or with your best friend, tell them all these things and not have to worry about that. You're not worried about being judged. This is, I think, like the most simplistic way to think about privacy. But of course, when it scales and it's now privacy and it's relating to like tech companies and big data and like all of these other third party things, that's, I mean, that's a whole other ballgame. But I agree with this general like definition of privacy. So while the Five Eyes Alliance certainly plays a crucial role in global security, it's equally important to remember that privacy forms a cornerstone of democratic societies. As such, the Alliance's activities highlight the need for a delicate balance between security and individual rights a balance that remains a significant topic of ongoing debates. I still don't know how I feel about this. If you're caught on CCTV and they use facial recognition to realize that you are a criminal, how do we feel about that? But then what do we think about facial recognition on CCTV that's being used like just in general? I mean, if someone's committed a crime and it helps them find the criminal, as the victim, 
it's really hard when someone gets away with something and there's no closure. So the fact that they can use CCTV to help find these people, that's, that's huge. But then at what point is it ethical or not ethical to be using facial recognition on the general public through CCTV? But if it's like they're using CCTV and like predictive models to do facial recognition to identify someone that might commit a crime later down the line, that's unethical to me. You have nothing, yeah, exactly. You have nothing to hide until a new government comes in that disagrees with your values. Yep. I'm not really, I'm not really for it. It opens the door too much. Are there any metrics around its use and its effectiveness? That's a good question. Not all crimes happen on camera though. No, most don't. I think there's a difference between passive intelligence and actionable intelligence. That's a good distinction to make. I'd be interested to hear what you define as passive intelligence versus actionable intelligence. If it's only for the criminals, it's okay, but it's never only for that. For one, crim- for the criminal to be found on CCTV, it has to scan everyone's face. And I don't use any voice activated services because it creeps me out. For them to know that I've said, hey Siri, it needs to listen to everything I say. When it comes to this kind of thing, it's like it's all or nothing. Don't forget that they get to decide who is a criminal and often without even taking the law into account. I'm fine if they strictly limit the human access to this of those footage, but that's the thing. Biometric data would be so valuable so valuable hackers would be targeting that stuff you know what i mean they'd have to have a really good security posture these days it's like privacy comes down to a combination of do i trust the people who have who i'm giving access to this information and do i trust these people to secure the information like those are both concerns because there will be people with nefarious intent that want to access to the information and you have to make sure that whatever company or organization that has that information is going to protect it properly and most of the time it's no. But like sometimes I'll, I'll use Google services. They have enough infrastructure, security infrastructure, that I think that they'll probably do a decent job of protecting my data at the very least. Even if they're super creepy. It's at a certain point, like you can't just inconvenience yourself all the time. Well, Google's really bad. I've given up with that one. They already know everything about me. Isn't facial rec- recognition the same as putting a label on every citizen? Yeah, yeah. But instead of using a physical label... You, and you, uh, you save that ID on a database. Well, it's actually worse because it's real-time facial recognition. You're not only labeling, but also tracking. You're tracking and you're using biometric data. So if somebody else were to gain access to this, this means that that person can never be anonymous so long as there is someone that, that has that data um, available to them, which is huge. We need, we need that. We act different in different contexts depending on the level of anonymity that we think we have. It can cause some serious psychological issues for us if we, we, had never, we can never be anonymous. Then it's like the only privacy is in your head. And that's like, that's when you go crazy. I'm enjoying having these conversations with you guys. Yeah, imagine if there's a data breach on a site that stores biometrics. Exactly. And like more and more companies want biometric data. And so it's just like, it's so stupid. It's like, I don't, I don't care if, if it's cheaper for you to have biometric data because you think that it means that you don't have to have employees that can verify people's identity. Like, I don't give a shit about that. I need you to not store biometric data because I don't trust you to store it properly. Like, you're going to get hacked, bro. <laughs> can we mention Mark Zuckerberg and Metaverse and all that? Why do you think it's going to be a big thing talking to a 3D model of someone instead of talking to their webcam face? I feel like it's becoming a big force trend. I think that it's predatory. He's trying to attract people that have a hard time making human connections. And which is, there's nothing wrong with that. It's human. It's human to want to feel needed. And like, if you struggle with that, it's okay. Like it's a learned skill. And if you didn't learn that as a child through your parents or through having siblings or like, there's a lot of things that lead up to you being able to be good in social situations. And if you're not, it's fine. What's unethical to me is like, He's trying to profit off of that. He's trying to profit off of people that are alone, that don't have someone that they can talk to. And so they're going and using these chatbots where they can feel needed and they can feel like they have a friend and they get away with whatever they want. Not even whatever they want. It's like if they have, if they lash out or whatever, they're having these very not real interactions and then they're just going to be disappointed or shunned when they have those real interactions with an actual human. And it's messed up. These are the people that need real community the most. And he's trying to keep them on his apps for as long as possible so that he can make money off of the fact that they they need connection. And he's trying to replace real human connection with these bots that are going to be his, their friends. I don't use Instagram anymore. I don't want to use Instagram. It's up. It really bothers me. UFO people are harmless. I agree. <laughs> Let them have their fun. Come on. 
They've been waiting decades for this. Okay, let's continue reading the Five Eyes Alliance, how to avoid the Five Eyes Alliance. If the idea of living under the potential gaze of the Five Eyes Alliance feels disconcerting, here are some strategies you can deploy to bolster your digital privacy. Now, we can't promise you'll become invisible to global intelligence services, a virtual private network, as your personal invisibility cloak online. It disguises your internet connection and make your online activities much harder to monitor. That is very misleading to say it's your personal invisibility cloak. Let me explain. VPN provides you with an encrypted tunnel. So basically between the network that you're connected to and the VPN provider, nobody can interfere with that traffic and see what it is that you are searching. But once it's, it's not end to end encrypted. So it's encrypted in transit, but where it lands for your VPN host, they can still see all your, all your, your traffic. Yeah, technically all VPN companies can see your traffic and history. However, most of them choose to discard the information by directing it to a null file or voter. By doing so, they're adhering to so-called strict no-log policies. So I use Proton VPN for the record. I like Proton VPN. Harness the power of encryption. End-to-end -end encryption is good. End-to-end -end encryption means it's encrypted at rest. So when it's stored on the server, people can't see what that data is. No one can see it while it's while it's going between the server and your machine. Only people in the conversation can decipher the messages. Keep prying eyes out. Go incognito with browsers and search engines. Browsers such as Tor and search engines such as DuckDuckGo are your allies in the quest for privacy. So agreed, agreed, obviously. But again, this is where I give in to the mega corp. As somebody who's spouting all this nonsense about privacy, Google is, they are so creepy, but I've given up with them. DuckDuckGo is, it's not as good because they're not as creepy. <laughs> Firefox is the worst, wait, why? What did they do recently? Tread carefully on social media. It's tempting to share life updates on social media, which my personal life is not content. Yeah, life updates and stuff. That's a goldmine for personal information. Regularly review your privacy settings and be thoughtful about what you post. Also, PayPal. For any of you that use PayPal, be careful. If you use PayPal for anything, by default, you can see a lot of information on there that you would not necessarily want to share. And I stopped using PayPal because of it. And then lock up your devices. Keep your devices patched with the latest security updates. Go the extra mile with strong and unique passwords and consider encrypting sensitive data. The reason why it's helpful to have unique passwords and not reuse passwords is because if there's a data breach, a lot of, a lot of places get popped, okay? Generally, they'll leak the username and password list. During that data leak, they've now seen, okay, this password is associated with this email and they might try that on a bunch of different sites. And sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. Have a different password for every account use a password manager. I really like um, KeePass because it's local. You don't have to, it's not network connected. Um, you can just, you can just have it on a USB or something that you plug in and you're good. Then if there is a data breach, it's no biggie. That one account got popped. I'll just reset it. A lot, a lot of people like one password as well. Yeah. YubiKeys, love that. And then a strong password, length entropy is very important. So making it a very long password is very good. If they're trying to brute force it, it's going to take so long that they just, they can't. Firefox. Firefox. Oh, you guys were saying they, they implemented telemetry? Huge L. It's such an interesting topic and it's one that's not really discussed enough. I mean, I'm just spouting my own opinions of like ideas. If you have any, um, any people that you, that you enjoy listening to these things, let me know. Anyway, I hope you guys have a brilliant rest of your night. Thanks for hanging out. I super appreciate it.